Digital ad spending will be $76 billion in the US this year. 10 billion of that will be wasted. Digital has disrupted nearly every aspect of life, including advertising, but the complexity of digital has created what Mark Pritchard of P&G famously called murky at best, fraudulent at worst. Brands today have asymmetric information, which means that they're at a disadvantage in understanding where their money goes. Basically, that leads to waste, a lot of it. The complexity of digital makes it harder for people to know where their advertising dollars are going. I spoke with Sam Tomlinson, media leader and partner at PwC, whose team audits the digital strategies of the world's biggest brands. He often has his clients come to him and say, am I paying too much? Am I paying too many people? And where's my money going? PwC did a report in 2020 that found that about 85% of media dollars were properly accounted for. However, about 15% were a question mark. So we wanted to understand how advertisers should be thinking about media waste, how they can ensure they're not falling victim to it, and what types of things to look out for when determining which ad channels or platforms to buy through. I went to London to sit down with Sam Tomlinson at MadFest to talk about this. So check out my conversation. Well, thanks for joining me today. Very, uh, very happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so Sam, you are at PwC. And you work with a lot of like large global brands, and they come to you with challenges that they're looking to solve, specifically when it relates to media and their investments in marketing. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of what are they coming to you with? What are they looking for? What are some of the challenges that the large brands that you're, you work with see? So I think in general, um, most large brands have are relatively mature in terms of how they manage and govern and monitor their their offline media, you know, they've had many, many, many decades of experience with that. And, mm -hmm. in like, and you can buy an offline, offline media, you can buy a billboard and you see exactly where your money goes and you see it out in the open. Here's this beautiful billboard with my brand on it, right? That's, that's a great example. And if you compare that with, with digital out of home, um, it's much harder to verify that your ad has played. It, sure. In the billboard world, you walked past, or actually in the UK, you had literally a guy in a van who drove past, took a photo, there's your ad. Sure. Uh, in, in a digital billboard, you, you can't do that. Um, and I think people forget that digital media, even though it's now huge, is still relatively new, it's relatively nascent. Mm -hmm. There's still governance, it, process control is still playing catch up. And, and brands come to us looking for advice on how to um, manage and optimize and monitor their digital media. Okay, so they come to you and say, listen, I'm investing X percent of my budget in digital programmatic and what are some of the I mean they sort of say to you am I investing in the right way am I paying the right price um, and so your team kind of dives in to the details there yeah that's that's exactly right um, uh, and and this could apply across all digital media whether that's paid search or social uh, you know YouTube programmatic um, and brands will come to us and, and they might start by saying am I paying the right price for my digital media right and, and actually most digital media is biddable so you know you're paying market price. That's how the auction works. Right. Um, the real question is, am I bidding for the right audience, the right context, the right time? You know, that, that is a question about the value of your digital media, not the price. And I know one of the things that you've mentioned to me in the past is that one of the, or some of the brands you've worked with, like you audited where their placements were appearing and they're appearing on maybe 100,000 websites. Can you talk a little bit about like, what does that mean to a brand and, and why that might be problematic for them? Yeah, that, that's a really good example. Um, so we did a, a big study in 2020 in the UK looking at programmatic advertising supply chains, um, trying to understand how much of a brand's money reaches the publisher. Um, and in the course of that, one of the things that we also looked at was where ads were appearing. And, and, and these were 15 really sophisticated premium advertisers in the UK. And in a three month period, um, the average number of websites that they appeared on uh, in those months, three, two years ago, was 40,000. Um, the range, about half of the advertisers in our study were at 5,000 websites or fewer, which we which seems pretty good practice. Right. Yeah. Um, the others were ranged from 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. The winner was 150,000. Um, and you know, hopefully it would be obvious, uh, but I will say it anyway. You do not need to appear on 150,000 websites right. to reach everyone in the UK. Right. And the, the more you appear on long tail websites, the more your risks rise around fraud, mm -hmm. viewability, brand safety, brand right. suitability, right. and spend leakage. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so basically when you, you did this study, you looked at, okay, I'm 
uh, let's call on Telegraph, okay? Mm-hmm. And how much of the money that a brand like Toyota, I'm making up these names, goes to the publisher Telegraph? And what did you guys find in terms of like, if I have a dollar to spend as a brand, how much of that actually ends up in the publisher's pocket? Yeah, so in our study, uh, and again, remember this was premium, this was premium advertisers, premium publishers, sure. the biggest, best known tech vendors. So almost exactly half of the money was reaching the publisher, and there was about 15% that was contractually unattributable. No. Mm-hmm. So just so half of it, 50% was going to the publisher, 50% was the other 50% was going to ad tech vendors. Yeah, agencies. Agencies. Ad, yeah. And we should be careful. A phrase that's used often, which I really don't like, is working media. Okay. So working media is used to signify how much reaches the publisher, but agencies are working, working really hard. Sure, absolutely. Tech vendors play a really important role. Um, and, and so what we found was roughly 50% reaching the publisher. There was another 35% that was um, attributable to agencies, tech vendors, data overlays, mm-hmm. verification tools. Um, but then there was 15% that, that was, was unaccounted un- for. Un- Interesting. For. So, yeah. so 85% of it was on the up and up. Yeah. Um, and 15% uh, was sort of a question mark. I mean, what did what since then? If we if we had to give ourselves a grade, like, would you say that that problem has been solved? Has that money, you know, where is that money going? Yeah, um, we were always we all, we were asked for a lot about the fifteen percent delta. The cause is we were always clear in our explanations. We didn't think there was a single root cause. We thought it was okay. an aggregation effect of data quality um, and, and and other causes. Foreign exchange would be an issue in there, and, and we thought all of these causes were aggregating to fifteen percent. Mm-hmm. Um, We believe progress has been made. Um, There's been a task force running in the UK, a a cross-industry task force, that's taken steps to improve data access and data quality. We are rerunning that study right now, results by the end of this year. I don't think the problem will be fully solved, but I I am very confident significant progress has been made. Um, If we can see that delta down from half what it was before, that's good progress. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that that's significant for brands because um, they, especially as... We're going into this environment where people are going to be tightening their belts. Like they want to understand where their media is going. Um, So, you know, it's funny. I was uh, I was a couple years ago working on a project, and I was working with somebody who said, "Oh, well, we reach um, 85 percent of the U.S. consumers," and I was like, "There's just no way that that's true." Um, You know, and if you look at like if you took, I assume if you're a brand and you look at all of the uh, publishers uh, platforms that you work with. People, you probably, people probably would say, oh, you reach about 150% of the U.S. audience. It's like, well, there's just no way to, to do that. So how do you, like, how do, how do you think about um, what people are saying? Where is there um, room for improvement? How do brands keep track of all of this? How do they measure um, and really understand, like, okay, well, how do I reach my audience in the right way? And um, what, are, what are the real numbers and what is the real size of my opportunity here? So, 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 let's, so a brand has done this, you know, segment, target, position analysis, and, and then you need to start thinking about where is the audience that I want to reach. And this is where, in a constructive way, we recommend brands think about the audience data being provided by platforms and publishers and third parties. Broadly, you've got a choice between publisher or platform first party audience data and third party data. You know, the work that our team's done has generally left us very impressed with premium publisher accurate, certified, permissioned first party data. Mm-hmm. In contrast, we have some skepticism about the permissioning and accuracy of third party data. Understood. Okay. And so what you sort of advise your clients on is try to invest as much as you can in your own first party data, um, you know, and supplement where possible or where you need to, but really first party data is sort of the key. And that's only going to become more important next year when With Google cookies. yeah, discontinues third party cookies. So sure. customer as, you know, as a brand, you need customer first-party data. In terms of what I would rely on when you're targeting, I'd be looking at publisher first-party audience data. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so we did, we did a little bit of work together. Um, Channel Factory worked with PwC to sort of um, validate that our process and technology can help brands to 
um, invest their dollars more wisely. Um, and one of the things that we found is language was uh, sort of a, a big challenge, I guess, or or an issue um, that brands are investing on a platform like YouTube, and they're seeing, oh, actually, I want to run in you know, the UK. Um, so here are the five languages that are most popular in the UK, um, but they might actually accidentally be running on languages that, you know, aren't prominent in the UK. So what is that, what, what did that sort of work look like that we did together as a, as a team? Yeah. Um, so, so, so basically we were independently testing some of the, uh, the statements, the claims that the channel factory makes about its, about its technology. Um, and what, as you say, one of the most interesting areas is, is language. So, uh, when content is uploaded to a platform, um, the person uploading that content self-selects um, the the metadata associated with that content, which would include language. Sure. Um, and you know, I, either deliberately or accidentally, that metadata is often wrong. So, as an advertiser, if you're saying that I want to run against languages A, B, C. Um, where Channel Factory can help is they can independently assess whether that content is actually in one of those languages. And, and what we found was the, um, the Channel Factory technology was very, very effective at identifying the language of the content, um, mm -hmm. more so than the, uh, the um, self-identified metadata. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense. I mean, user-generated content platforms, like a lot of it relies on the user. So, um, you know, it's if you could have a partner that can help you suss out what is the, the the truth behind this content? I think that's that's helpful for brands. So, yeah, a, 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 absolutely. I mean, um, actually, independent verification is at the heart of PwC. Right? You know, we started as an audit firm, so sure. uh, we are always fans of, of independent checking, verification, advice, um, anything to ensure that 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 brands ensure their money is spent spent as wisely as possible. Do you mind talking to me a little bit about? sort of the quality of the agencies, how they're executing their campaigns, um, what does that look like, and how do, how do you sort of help brands assess the, the quality of, of the agency campaigns? So yeah, we, we think this is an incredibly important topic, and one of the things that, that we found through the course of that study in 2020 was that the, um, the range of agency fees for digital advertising was pretty narrow, which I suspect shows, you know... The market a, works. The market works, yeah. Assertive procurement functions doing their job. Sure. Um, in contrast, the, the quality of the agency teams really varied hugely. You know, s some were absolutely outstanding, and yet others were not. And we think that's a really important finding. Sure. So if I was a brand looking for an agency team, um, I would not be focusing on that agency fees because they're going to be in a pretty narrow range anyway. Yeah. I would be looking at the quality of the team. And if that means paying a few percentage points more to get the very best team really focused on my account, executing really high quality campaigns. That will pay huge dividends far in excess of, of the extra fees. So um, mm. when you're assessing an agency, where we work with our clients is we help them assess the quality of the team far more so than the price of the team. Oh, that makes a ton of sense because I guess there's a huge variability when it comes to, to talent and the capabilities. And so yeah. it makes a ton of sense that, um, that your team is sort of helping just be that the extra set of eyes yeah. um, and, and really dive in there. Yeah. Quality over price. Absolutely. That would be our mantra. Yeah. I love that. Um, I think that probably relates to like publishers, platforms, you know, across the industry, right? P quality is important. And I think where, where we saw some of the challenges is when we, uh, as an industry, started to say, well, price is really important too. And that's when we sort of swung to the other side where now people are landing on 100,000 different websites. Yeah. Um, and I think the pendulum is starting to swing back. Like, what do you see for the next two, three, four yeah. years? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic it's swinging back too. I think um, the deprecation of third party cookies ultimately will mean that, you know, chasing audiences, retargeting, will yeah. start to dry up. Once that starts to dry up, and then you're reliant on premium contextual environments and accurate, verified, permissioned first party data that naturally plays to the strengths of premium publishers. Yeah. So um, if I was a premium publisher, I'd be feeling pretty optimistic about the next couple of years. Absolutely. Yeah, even in the face of you know economic headwinds. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes a ton of sense because it's like we started with uh, context was always important, right? And then it became unimportant and audience took over. And now I think you're right, especially with the dep depreciation of third-party cookies. Um, context is, is hot again. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think context <laughs> will be important. Yeah. and. Uh, 
uh, obviously that will play to, to your strengths as absolutely. someone that helps assess the quality of a contextual environment. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Sam. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Not at all. Nice to be here.